Joining us now on the line from Washington, D.C., Patrick Cronin. He is Senior Director of the Asia Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Patrick Cronin, it's good of you to join us on the line from the American Capitol. How are you tonight? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Not at all. I want to start by actually reading back to you some words that you wrote and get you to explain them a little more, if you wouldn't mind. You wrote, to the extent that the world economy has a geographical center, it is in the South China Sea. So let's start with that. What makes that part of the world so important in your view? Well, it's taking a long view at the 21st century and the belief that Asia Pacific in general is going to dominate mm -hmm. the economic and political developments in this century. And when you think about where the Indo-Pacific, where the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean join, it's in the South China Sea, specifically in the Strait of Malacca, where you have the mass of humanity in South Asia, especially India, meeting 10 Southeast Asian countries and, and up to China and Northeast Asia. And so you just have this tremendous commercial energy and human traffic going right through the South China Sea. It's just odd because I, I suspect most people think that Americans think that the geographical center of the world economy is somewhere in North America. And uh, so let me follow up. You've also written the South China Sea is where globalization and geopolitics collide. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, what we mean in, in this report by uh, the collision of globalization and geopolitics is that Asia Pacific is complex, that there's change in continuity. Those are other generalizations to explain the same thing. Globalization means that the world is trading globally and half of the global tonnage that goes by sea, and remember 90% of everything that is traded in the world goes by sea, half of that tonnage goes right through the South China Sea. For the United States alone, it's $1.2 trillion a year in trade. Uh, the enormous energy and merchandise trade that goes through this region is vital to every country's economy and to globalization. But the flip side is that very old-fashioned nationalism, disputes, territorial claims, uh, ethnic, religious, and sectarian differences persist even in the 21st century. And there's therefore great rivalry and strategic distrust, and therefore globalization and geopolitics collide in this very region. Let's get a sense of uh, why this is such a strategically important part of the world. Talk to us about natural resources, oil, natural gas, that kind of thing. What is thought to be under the South China Sea? Well, give it a decade and we may have different views of what's under the South China Sea because their surveys have not been uh, permitted to really tell us the answer. We do know that the Chinese have invested $20 billion to try to find out what is under the South China Sea because they think it could be a second Persian Gulf. There could be up to or even more than 200 billion barrels of oil in the South China Sea. Mind you, proven reserves are only about a tenth of that so far. But between that and gas, other minerals, and fishing stocks, this could really be a huge repository of resources for resource ravenous uh, growing economies of Asia. And make us a list of those countries that you believe have a territorial claim to those resources. Well, the problem is that nobody has neat boundaries at sea. And international law doesn't fully answer all the questions about exactly where seabeds uh, stop and who owns them. And there are overlapping claims on the minerals, fishing stocks, and hydrocarbons in these waters. You've got half a dozen countries with claims in the South China Sea. You know, if you were to move up north, you've still got uh, disputes in the East China Sea as well. But the biggest disputes are really China and everyone else, because China has put forward a very vague nine dashed line boundary which they don't define very accurately, but essentially it, it claims 90% of the South China Sea. That intrudes very closely on the Philippines, on Vietnam, and on other countries in Southeast Asia. And there is no single mechanism for resolving who owns this. Well, we do know that China's got a very muscular military and that they've made significant improvement and growth to their navy lately. I wonder if you could sort of take us, um, take us through some of those changes that China's current naval expansion uh, has comprised. Yes. The last decade in particular, China has just continued to invest heavily in the People's Liberation Army and the so-called People's Liberation Army Navy. Uh, 
Uh, this is a new direction for China, which historically has been a ground land power. Uh, but in the past couple of decades, but in the last decade in particular, they've started to invest in what we call a blue water navy that could potentially over time really start to dominate and provide sea control, not just in the South China Sea, East China Sea, but protect their sea lines of communication out through the Indian Ocean. And they're investing in traditional naval platforms. The aircraft carrier that they have on trial right now is not any particular threat in and of itself, but it's a portent of a blue water navy that they seem to aspire to build. More importantly, they're starting to build at a very fast rate submarines. Submarines are very stealthy by definition and therefore pose a big threat. They're combining these kind of naval assets uh, with fifth generation aircraft, with electromagnetic spectrum uh, investments. And I'm talking about cyber warfare, space and anti-space uh, weapons. None of this at this point really provides the potent anti-access to American power projection in 2012. The concern is going into the next decade, who will be investing more in these kinds of anti-access capabilities or anti-anti-access capabilities? Hmm. Um, and one sees a trend where China could be uh, taking the lead. The people in that building behind you, and of course up Pennsylvania Avenue as well, are most interested in what transpires there. And I want to read a little excerpt from uh, your piece that you wrote with, uh, that you wrote rather, with Robert Kaplan uh, in the CNAS uh, report, January 2012. American interests are increasingly at risk in the South China Sea due to the economic and military rise of China and concerns about its willingness to uphold existing legal norms. The United States and countries throughout the region have a deep and abiding interest in sea lines of communication that remain open to all, both for commerce and for peaceful military activity. China, however, continues to challenge that openness, both by questioning historical maritime norms and by developing military capabilities that allow it to threaten access to this maritime region. Let's just start to unpack that a little bit if we can. What do you see as um, American interests in this region? Well, American interests in this region are a microcosm of global interests in freedom of navigation, free trade and access and commerce around the world so that all countries can have a chance to prosper and benefit by fair rules of the road. And in South China Sea, the rules of the road have been written over time by many countries, including largely with U.S. insurance and protection, especially since the Second World War, where the United States has helped to guarantee freedom of navigation for all. Now, under customary international law, for instance, uh, countries are allowed the uh, right of peaceful passage of their of their military ships within 200 nautical miles uh, of a country that is within their exclusive economic zones but not within their 12 nautical mile uh, territorial limits okay. China disagrees with that and they have passed domestic laws to say that they will fight back essentially uh, and push back that's why we've had in the past 10 years two major military incidents with China one uh, the EP3 aircraft that we had a near collision uh, and was forced down to land on Hainan Island in 2001, and then the harassment of the U.S. Uh, survey ship Impeccable back in 2009. Almost surely there's going to be a third incident because there's a disagreement on these rules of the road. Freedom of navigation and sea lines of communication are core interests, but beyond that, it's also the American ability to protect our allies and our partners in the region. We have very long-standing alliances, and the countries in this region are counting on a continued U.S. presence and engagement in this region. As you look at it, China is presumably trying to assert its claims there, militarily, through the courts, through negotiation. What seems to be, at the moment, their favored means of achieving what they want? Yes, uh, you know, China has, uh, China is really more than one actor in a sense here. And this is one thing we have to keep in mind. Um, when so many of us do business with China or have negotiations with China, um, we're dealing with one set of Chinese actors, but then when you're dealing with the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the internal security, the propaganda arm of China, they, send, they tend to have a different agenda. And um, despite the, the military arm growing, China is still leading mostly with civilian and law enforcement means to contest claims and to assert their jurisdictional administration of the South China Sea. What do I mean? They're sending in fishing boats and encouraging fishing boats, um, not that they control where every fisherman goes, uh, 
but they're encouraging fishermen to go into disputed areas to show that China has the right to these areas in the South China Sea. They're sending in their Coast Guard and Coast Guard-like civilian law enforcement ships to then enforce fishing laws and fishery administration laws, and they're arresting Vietnamese fishermen and Philippine fishermen, um, and the Philippines and Vietnam are doing likewise to the extent that they're capable of that. So they like the civilian approach first. It, it, it mixes with Chinese strategy in the sense that they've devised something in the last decade um, called the three warfares, where they look at psychological, legal, and informational means of achieving their aims. Now, they're doing a lot of things under the surface, in space and cyberspace, that are just not visible as well, and they're investing heavily in matters that could lead them into uh, much more dominance in the South China Sea in the 2020s and beyond. And that could become a bigger issue uh, in future years. I wonder as well if you think that kind of aggressive approach, if I can call it that, by China might backfire. I mean, it's, is, it, is it possible that, uh, you know, the Vietnams, the Philippines of the world might decide to snuggle up closer to the United States, uh, which presumably would be a better ally in this case uh, if they knew, you know, the lay of the land is the way it is now? Well, it's, a, it's true, and that's really what's happened in the last two years. I've had the privilege of sitting in uh, two meetings with more than 25 chiefs of defense from Asia Pacific, and there's no doubt that every country represented in that, those two meetings was very concerned about China's assertiveness, if not aggressiveness, on these uh, disputes and claims and, and just asserting its power. Um, China hasn't always pursued things aggressively, though. In fact, in many ways, peaceful rise, um, biding their time has really been the hallmark ever since Deng Xiaoping's uh, opening of China to the world and the amazing economic success of the Chinese uh, people. But the problem here is that uh, as China's economy has grown, some of their appetite for asserting their rights ha has also grown. Hmm. And in the last couple of years, they got overly assertive. I think now they want to be a little more diplomatic. And so they're vacillating between assertiveness and uh, let's get along and let's, let's cooperate. And right now they're more cooperative, but who knows what cycle will be in next year. Sure. Let me get your view on America's response to some of this, because I gather a couple of months ago the U.S. decided to put 2,500 Marines in northern Australia, and China's reaction to that was to question the U.S.'s, quote, Cold War thinking that they thought could destabilize the region further. So what do you think about the American troop placement there? Well, I think it's an excellent idea. Australia's uh, one of our very closest allies. We need to show, the United States needs to show that we are a, not only a permanent Asia power, um, but we're going to be engaging and having presence for, for decades to come. Um, and one way to do that is to start to d divide and disperse our presence, which is so heavily concentrated in Northeast Asia, and to start to, in this case, rotate forces through an existing Australian base cooperating with the Australian Defense Forces, maybe inviting third countries in for training, and being able to show that we have the means to uh, operate out of different areas of this vast Indo-Pacific region. So I think it was an excellent start. This has long been in the works. This was negotiated years ago in terms of uh, by the George W. Bush administration, even back to the 1990s, we were talking about how can we better use Western and North, Northern Australia as a base. I think next you'll be looking at the Philippines, going back to Subic, not in terms of a traditional large military base, but rather, uh, again, exercises, forward stationing, uh, and uh, dialogue. Hmm. In which case, Patrick, let me ask you one last question. Your, your colleague Bob Kaplan on that uh, piece that you wrote, the, re the report for the Center for a New American Security, he said the South China Sea is the future of global conflict. You agree with him on that? Well, I do. Uh, Bob's a, a terrific strategic thinker. He's also a great writer. Um, you know, the future of conflict, there's a lot of strategic uncertainty. We, the administration here has talked a lot about the pivot to Asia as though we know for sure uh, the next concern is just in Asia. We don't know that. Nobody does that because the rest of the world has a vote. But the maritime dimension of the Indo-Pacific region and of the South China Sea in particular, where the Strait of Malacca poses a huge strategic dilemma for all countries. If you close down the Strait of Malacca, or conversely, if you can control the Strait of Malacca, you have enormous power over the energy and merchandise trade that everybody depends on in this region. 
Nobody wants to shut it down, certainly in the United States. The whole idea is we want to make sure that we could maintain that artery uh, if we had to. China, with its anti-access capabilities growing over time, could eventually say, look, the United States can't keep that open. We'll keep that open. We are now supplanting the United States. And so you better change your calculus about what it means to be in the Asia-Pacific region, because it's now China-centered, not U.S.-centered. Hmm. Understood. Patrick Cronin, it's good of you to join us on the line from Washington tonight. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.